Whoa, what's up, everybody? So in today's Coffee Q&A, we're going to be talking about tempers, all about tempers and everything that you might need to know about how to use a hand coffee temper. So let's get right into it. How y'all doing today, by the way? All right, so we've got our basic temper here. This is the temper that I prefer. This is the Reg Barber coffee temper. And this is actually my first coffee temper, the one that I bought back in 2003. So it's all, it's like 19 years old. And this is really the temper that kind of took the industry by storm. Now, there were tempers that were made before this one. And, of course, there's many that are made after. But this is really the one that set the standard and really just brought the whole temper industry to life. And this is the, the classic, the original design with stainless steel piston and a Bubinga wood handle and a Delrin insert. All right. And some of you may be wondering, like, why is there a Delrin insert? What's this for and why Delrin? So back in the early 2000s and before when a lot of us were just starting out, the, uh, the technique was to, you know, we would dose the coffee into the portafilter, distribute, and then we would, is that right? Distribute. It's been so long. So we would distribute the coffee and then we would tamp a little bit. Oh yeah, tamp and then tamp again. And the idea behind this whole of tapping your, and people would do all kinds of like things. Some people even use the, the stainless steel part and they would tap all the way around. The idea was that by tapping on the sides of the portafilter, you would kind of, I guess, loosen up the sides again, and then you would tamp one more time. You would, you would tamp, yeah, so that's right, you would tamp, tamp again, and that would loosen up the sides and then re reattach them. And, and that the theory there was that we were going to get better um, seal and distribution across the coffee bed. As time went on, we got away from that and we stopped using the, the tapping part. But if you look at if you have if you find people that have older gear like early two thousands era gear, you'll see that some of the porta filters have dings on them. Like this one is not so bad, but like you can I don't know if you can really see that too well here, but you can see kind of like some some pittings and ding. Well, no, this is, doesn't really have that. Not as bad as the other ones. I think that's more casting issues. But if you look at some of them, you'll see like you know dents in it basically. What's up, young man? Good to see you, man. How's everything going? Oh, yes, temper tantrum. Good. Um, but anyway, so that's what the Delrin Instar is for. So for tampers of a certain era, you'll see these a lot on them or some kind of um, some kind of coating that would lower that. Now, for example, I've got a whole bunch of tampers to show you here. Now, one of the earliest designs of a tamper is this plastic one from La Marzocco, right? So this is a, it used to come packed in with every espresso machine. I think now La Marzocco with the new machine still gives you a tamper, but I think it's it's of a bridge barber quality rather than this old kind of janky now, if you can believe this, the, the other the tempers that came with a lot of other machines back in the late 90s, early 2000s, were much less nice. And this is actually, compared to a lot of the, the ones that came with espresso machines, this was actually pretty nice because it's got a thick shaft, a good size piston, right, 58 millimeter, and then a top handle that gives you a little bit of force. And we're going to go over what the four, where the top handles and all that goes and why they're there and how to best utilize them in a moment. But this was like one of the earliest style models. Like people actually like these. These weren't these were not bad. They're not great. They 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 fit pretty well. There was a lot of space, right? There's still a lot of space to move around. Then based off of this one, oh, based off of this one, or maybe it was the other way around. But this one is the the Ergo Packer. It says Ergo Packer here. 
you can see that. And this was made by Espresso Vivace and David Schomer. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with Espresso Vivace and David Schomer, David Schomer is essentially the godfather of espresso industry wide. Like he was the guy in Seattle in the late '90s who was sitting there like a lot of the people involved in, in coffee, fanatics, like a fanatical kind of guy, obsessive, kind of crazy. And all he was doing was trying to make the most perfect espresso. So he was working, so he designed his own tamper. He worked with machine designers to design better machines with Lamarzocco, with Senesa, with all these other companies. And he's been in the game for many years. He's really the godfather of what we do. And so... He created this, and I do believe he still sells this one. This is an aluminum tamper, all aluminum. So it's got aluminum piston, aluminum shaft, and it does come apart because, as you can see here, it says 58 millimeter. That's because he actually had different sizes. And I feel I think a lot of them still do. Like, well, like for example, um, Reg Barber had different sizes. You could actually order it in tenth of a millimeter right so you get 58.3 if you wanted to have a 58.3 if you were that precise you know i don't know if you ever needed to be that precise like some people really wanted like a super snug fit right i'm happy with a 58 millimeter if i get like a millimeter half a millimeter to play with that's fine i don't need to be too tight because what happened what we found is that not like a lot of baskets especially the non-vst baskets the stampings weren't exact, like they weren't like down to micrometer level, right? So you would have times if you had a 58 point, I don't know, let's say 58.5, and you had a 58 millimeter basket, it may be that the tolerance was a little bit tight. So, you know, I don't know if that's really necessary to go to that craziness. So after the show, another one that, so not after the show, this one is made by a company called Bumper. And again, it's following the David Schomer style of design. The piston's a little bit shallow, you know, not as high, right? And, but this one has a rubberized coating that's getting a little bit like, you know, snowy looking. But basically, again, the rubberized coating was to, and they, I, I do it on the wings, but people would tap all over their, their portafilter, right? We've gone away from that. Like, we don't recommend that kind of thing anymore. That's just old craziness. But that's the bumper. The Shomer, the bumper. What else do we have here? This particular one is made by a company called Espresso Parts. And it, it was like one of the early competitors to the Reg Barber. Like, for example, a lot of people like the Vivace might have been the first one, the Ergo Tamper. But it really was Reg Barber that really took the market by storm and really was the one that kind of made – he made the one that you really wanted because this was handmade. The Bubinga wood was from Africa. The Delrin insert, I mean, it's wonderfully balanced. It really was the best temper made. And I still think that this is probably the best temper made today. Even today, like, Reg kind of went out a bit – Business of a couple of years back, but he's back again, working in the industry, making tempers. I'm not sure the procedure on getting his tempers right now, but he's up in um, in Victoria, British Columbia. So you just kind of have to go to look at his website, call him up. But the uh, the espresso parts typically had this this kind of shape, right? So comparatively to the the reg, it was more squat. So some people like the squat shape of it. It didn't fit. I mean, it's fine for me, but I preferred the taller. Again, a lot of what happens with espresso tempers, it's really about personal preference. So ideally, especially nowadays when there's so many choices available to you, it's best to try to like go out and find them or at least meet people that use different ones and ask them, hey, man, can I feel that? Can I give that a try for a moment? And try to get a better feel for what fits your hand the best. Another one that came out, and I think this is the Espro. Is that right? This is where the company don't put their name on it. <laughs> and years later, it's like you can't remember this. So this is all stainless steel. It kind of looks like a bishop, right? A chess bishop. 
And it's a nice temper, but if you, if I don't know if you can see this, but if you look closely here on the side of the piston, you can see these little dents. That's damage from tamping or from the uh, the knocking on the portafilters from that era. There's even some here on the on the bottom of the piston. I don't know if you can see that too well, but that is a. Uh, yeah, that's just the old indications of how people would like, you know, tap on them. And these were all tampers that kind of resided in at Spro at the one of the earlier shops of Spro of that. And so people would we would let our baristas, we would have a, a whole selection of tampers for our baristas to try. Now later in the years we did it, we got away from having all these tampers as we really honed in and focused down on what tampers we liked. But in the early days, we had all these tampers to play around with. And so we got some other tempers. This one's also another James, um, another Reg Barber. This is a different one, maple wood. This one I had made for Spro years ago, and um, you could have your logo laser etched and then filled in with with an enamel on the top. And this was a flat 30, 58 millimeter burst with the flat surface. I like the flat surface. Now, as we went on, this is the other temper from one of the Spurrows as well. This one, you can, it's hard to see the logo that was, that was there. It's kind of worn out. This is actually the one we use at the Hamden shop for, as the primary temper. This one has the, uh, this, this, uh, oh gosh, what was the name of this style? But it's concentric, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's circular, right? And what the idea was that these ridges would kind of help push down and just kind of give more structure to the coffee bed. Now, another thing that was also popular that that the Schomer Ergo Tamper kind of has a very little bit. This one from Espresso Parts has a bit. You can kind of see them on the profile. They are convex, convex tampers. And this this other one that was one of my personal ones. What with with the Spro logo on it, this one also has. Uh, I think it was called this uh, under Reg Barber. It was the C tamper, but this one, as you can see, has a lot more of a convex plus the circular ridges, right? And if you notice on this one, the piston is also very much more shallow. I think that was more of a weight reduction savings, and it's also ch it does change the height of the tamper slightly, right? So if you look at the heights. They're a little bit different because there's less, there's less piston. And then Reg also had these aluminum handled, like this one has a, a little bit of an, it's not convex, it's just chamfered, right? That was the idea. And the idea between the, with the chamfering and the slight convexing is that it would create a concave shape on the coffee bed that the idea was that it was going to push the coffee just ever so slightly to the edges so that you would, you know, eliminate, you know, channeling side channel channeling along the side walls. And uh, so these were um, aluminum. This one was the one that I got as a competitor from one of the mid Atlantic regionals in 2007. And these were just aluminum, aluminum piss, uh, handles, shafts, with a powder coating, and then they laser etched this logo out of it. Now, the problem with these is that, especially during the earlier earlier years, when we were still tapping on the the portafilters, this that tapping on this particular tamper would chip the paint away. And so, if it, some I, I was I never really used this tamper, so um, I never had to worry about it. But if you see people from that era, if you, have, you can see if you ever find their tempers, you'll see they're all like dented and damaged and dinged. That's why, because they're tapping it on the thing. The next, the, the, okay, that's a, oh, so this one is a C flat. Oh, C flat is what they call it. Now, this one is just, there's no con convex, right? It's not convex. There's no chamfering. It's just straight circular patterns. And that's kind of, like I said, it's kind of like, um, I want to say irrigation, but it's kind of like, you know, just to hold, like little troughs to hold the, the water inside the coffee bed, right? Now, this particular one's a little bit 
of a fun, just something fun that I have. This is a tamper that Reg Barber made from the 2007 World Barista Championship. This was the champ. This is the tamper that won the 2007 World Barista Championship. It was gifted to me by James Hoffman. We were all there in Tokyo, and he was like, "Hey, man." I don't know why he gave it to me. I forgot why he gave it to me. He was like, he gave it to me. And I was like, oh, because he had just used it to, to compete at the finals. And this was the one that he used. There it is. Famous. My, my true claim to fame is a James Hoffman tamper. <laughs> All right. So that's the basics of tampers. Now, what is it that now, now, well, let's go on. So we now have. In modern times, we now have tempers like this one, which I can, I never really get this right. So this, this particular one is, uh, well, you know what this is. So these are the new generation of tempers that are designed that you can adjust the height or the depth of the piston. And then, and I don't know why, I can't separate these two right now. Uh, anyway, shows you how much I use them. These were actually um, tampers that I, they, these, this set was one that I bought uh, in Asia a couple of years back because I was just curious, right? They have all these ones that are out there that are like 200 bucks for like just this. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to spend that kind of money. That's crazy. Not for something that I just want to test. And I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm even like that interested with. But as all of you know, there's the distribution tool, right? The WDT. And then there's the tamper that you just kind of place in your... You place it in, and then it sits, and you kind of push down. The nice thing about these is that it helps you to get a pretty even tamp, right? One that, that re requires very little work to do. You basically set it in here, push down, and you're done and you've got a relatively flat puck surface, which is great. And that's, that's a good way to go, especially if you don't want to, or have the time to goodness. This is just, I mean, these were the cheap Chinese knockoffs, like 35 bucks or something like that. But you know what? What's really nice about these is that they are—they're easy. They're easy to use. You don't like this. These type of tampers, these hand tampers, really require practice. There's no, there's no way around that to really get um, to really use them properly and really to get the best results out of them. Oh, young must asking, was James Hoffman famous in 2007? No, no, James was just another one of the guys. You know, I've known James pretty much since he started in the business. Um, so we're, him and I entered the business about the same time. Of course, James was based in London. He was working for an espresso machine company. And, you know, but James always been a real thinker. But he always thought deeply about coffee and, and how to do it. And so, you know, we're all, all we're, a lot of us are from the same era, so... We all knew each other, and back then, in those days, there wasn't there wasn't really the internet in the way that it is today. Like you know, you can go to YouTube. There was no YouTube, and there really wasn't much of an exchange. And plus, since we're all starting out, and the whole idea of third wave and specialty coffee was really just burgeoning, there was very few venues where we could connect and communicate. And so back then, there was a place called coffeegeek.com run by a guy um oh no mark prince up in uh, vancouver Cal uh, vancouver canada and he had a on his website he was totally a home user like many of you guys are and really just geeking out and he made this website he was a, he was a web developer so he made this website that basically was the leading coffee resource of its time of course there was also I think coffee on places uh, on the on the um, not not IRC, but there was another place. Um, Alt.coffee.com, Alt.coffee, that's what it was called. And um, I wasn't so involved in there, but you know, somehow I found Coffee Geek, and a lot of us congregated there 
to discuss theory. And then later, uh, a lot of there was another guy up in Vancouver for or Can that part of Canada. These Canadian guys are really interesting. I don't know why they were always the ones that created the websites, but another guy created a, a website called Coffee. It's coffee with a D.com. And a lot of the professional discussions happened there. Like, you know, we would both talk. And so that's kind of how we all got, we would all throw out our ideas. And of course, you know, when you're new to the business and you just have, when you have a little bit of knowledge, you want to wield that knowledge like a sword, like as though you're ready to slay everyone and everyone is wrong and you're ready to vanquish the world of their coffee sins. So all of us are out there battling each other day in, day out. You know, myself, um, who are the famous people? Today? James Hoffman was, of course, part of that. Um, your favorite Korean dad, Nick Cho, was in the business at the time, and he was part of that discussion. So, yeah, we were all there arguing about coffee. And, yeah, so that's pretty much that whole deal. But no, in 2007, James was just one of the guys. He was just winning the world championship. And he was, I think he was just, it was before he, yeah, he was before he wrote any of the books. He was, or maybe he was in the middle of writing the books. And um, yeah, we also had blogs that we all wrote. Like he had a blog called Jim Seven. I, of course, had a blog, Ono Coffee. And we all talked about coffee and theories and, you know, pontificating about stuff we didn't really know too much about. And so now that you get older and you're more experienced and you, you're just not as, not fanatical, but you're just not as, uh, you just know that you're not completely 100% right all the time and everyone is wrong. <laughs> all right, so let's get to it. Let me put these aside here, our tampers. I only have all these tampers because, you know, I've, I, been in it at it for a while, and I have a sickness in that I like to have gadgets, but the gadgets, you know, but lately I haven't really been keeping up with the gadgets. Okay, let's get into it now. We're going to use this tamper here. This is the tamper we use at Spurs. So again, there's the basic components of the tamper is the piston, and this one's a stainless steel, and what I like about the stainless steel is that it gives some heft to it, right? It feels heavy, and... and you know, if we take something like the Schomer one, it's a nice one, but it, it doesn't have the heft, right? Like, it's lightweight. This has some heft, some real feel to it. So it really gives you, like, positive reinforcement, I feel. And then we've got the shaft. Now, the shafts will have different shapes. I personally like this shape. Now, you may not like this shape. You may find other shapes to your desire. But I like the way that it fits into my hand. All right? And so... Let's go over the basics on. Oh, yes, you have to find them. You have to look for those. All right, so how I think that, so if you're going to use a hand tamper, like the whole technique for using these type of tampers is really different. Like I don't, I think that depending on how much you're pushing down, but we'll go over that later. But this, with these hand tampers, you want to have, you want to pay attention to your ergonomics. It's super important to be cognizant of how you're handling the tamper because it can, improper technique can lead to repetitive stress disorders. And you don't really want that carpal tunnel syndrome, things like that. Those are not fun. So, don't, so be careful with how you use it. What you want to do is, I teach arboristas that they want to be, you want to have all of your holding power of the tamper in two fingers, your thumb and your middle finger, right? And basically you're going to be holding the tamper like this. So the thumb actually is vertically in line with the piston. And as you can see, I've got the, the top of the piston really kind of wedged here on the, on the palm, this, this little muscle right here under the thumb. Right. You want it to be like that. And then basically the, the finger, the middle finger just wraps around here at the top of the, the bottom, at the, at the bottom of the top of the piston, I guess is the best way to put that, right? This little bulbous area, you want it to wrap around here. And so you're really holding the piston, the, the tamper with these two fingers. Now the other fingers just kind of wrap around and 
they don't really do too much. Like this one here just kind of like hangs out at the lower part. And then these two just kind of wrap around. Otherwise, you're tamping like this. And, you know, we're not that highfalutin. Right. So you just kind of wrap it around. And that's the basic way you're going to hold the tamper. The idea is that your the, the shaft of your tamper is in the same line as your bone. Fibia? Fibia. I don't know what the bone is. 20 years into this, I still haven't figured out what bone it's supposed to be. But basically, you want it to always be in line with this bone. You never want to have any bending, you know, compared to that bone. It's always, if you can imagine that this is an extension of that bone and that it will never, it'll never bend, that's the best way to think about it, right? And you're going to be tamping that way. And you always want to keep your, your elbow at a 90 degree angle and that's going to give you the best ergonomics for you know thousands and thousands and thousands of tampings okay so let's let's review what we're, gonna, what we're really talking about is can we see so as you can see we're going to hold the tamper and i'm going to tamp what's the best way to see this so if i'm tamping you can kind of see that I'm tamping like this. Now I'm also contorting my body around so that it holds. And really, you can that's that's fine. Can you see that? Okay, good. Maybe over here. So you want to have your tamper doing that. And you want to have it like this. So you can see that I'm actually holding it kind of. You know, like that, right? So, now, how do we practice this? Now, in, in, in theories of, of espresso, we like to use so many pounds of pressure while we're tamping. The amount of pounds of pressure really are arbitrary. The important thing is that you do it consistently and consistent pressure. At Spro and, you know, the theory that we subscribe to, it's about 20 pounds of pressure. How do we practice that? The best thing is to do is to take a scale. This is just a cheap analog home scale that I got from Target or something like that. And this is perfectly fine and great for this purpose. You don't need anything fancy. This is probably like 20 bucks. Just a simple home scale. Okay. Now, if you have any questions about this, just feel free to ask them. And so what we're going to be doing is, as you can see here, we're going to be tamping until we reach 20 pounds. Right? 20 pounds. 20 pounds. So that's the idea. So what we're going to just set this on the tabletop. Ideally, the tabletop that you're going to be working on because, you know, it's... It's more or less similar in height. It's not really, it, even though it looks taller, it's not really that much taller. But place in the center and just press down. And for those of you who haven't been using a scale and you've been tamping, a lot of people when they first start tamping, they're like, they're putting their body weight into and they're really trying to get hard into it. You don't need to do that. Actually, 20 pounds is really light. So you put that there and just press down. 20. Now, for this exercise, I think that you should, how I train our baristas, let me adjust this camera just slightly. How we, you know, train our baristas is that, oh, water. We'll take the tamper, we'll tell them, okay, get on it, get your, get your, uh, get your technique correct, right, your ergonomics, tamp to 20, stop, hold it for just a moment, then release then let go and then come back. Come back. 20. Good. Come back. And why are we doing this kind of let go, push down, let go? Because we want the barista to get into the flow of, they're not always, like you could just sit here and go, uh, 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 uh. but that's not really, that's helping you to understand how much force. But what you're really, what we're really trying to do is get the, Get you into the practice of being able to grip the port, the 
being able to grip the tamper in, with the right ergonomics in the right way so that you can get to the point where you're basically just going to be doing your thing, coming out, and then going for it, right? So that's essentially the way that we, we do that. So those are the basic tips on how to use a tamper. Get back down to the level so you can we can talk a little bit easier. Now, when it comes to these type of tampers, right, of course, there's just this thing. And I think that, I don't know if there's really, see, this is what I don't like about it, right? So you're pushing, you're going to push down like this, right? And I can, my concern is that with this, because you're now pushing like this, so your wrist is bent, your hand is bent, and you're pushing down. Now, if you're just pushing down like this, right, like this, without bending, you're, you're just kind of going from your side, and you're pushing down, or more like pulling down rather than pushing, that's probably okay. But it's this, this pushing down part that I personally would be concerned about because, you know, especially if, if you're not, if you're not taking the time to, if you're just letting the weight of the tamper do the work for you, but if you're actually pressing down, then I think that could lead to repetitive stress disorders and like, you know, injuries on your wrist. And that's the thing that I think is a, a bit concerning about that. Like the other one, the distribution tool, you're just putting it in there and, spinning it around but i think this part this here is where you could run into repetitive stress disorders whereas this way um i think there's if you do it correctly this way lessens that chance i mean i've been doing this for 20 years so um and i have yet to have repetitive distress order repetitive stress disorders from tamping. It's actually something I've been concerned about for many years, making sure that we have the right technique. And, and what I also mean by that is ergonomically, like I said, you want to have your, your forearm vertical, your upper arm at a 90 degree angle. Now, if you actually see me in the field working, I'll actually, I actually don't do this anymore. I'm actually more tamping like this. Right, and this tamping, I'm probably, how much do I, let's see, if I do that, I'll come on here. No, I'll probably still do that. I may do it at an angle, but really the angle, if I'm doing it at an angle, the ergonomics are still the same, right? I'm still, the, the bone structure is still the same. The angle is still here, and it's just, is that right? Yeah, I will usually rotate the portafilter slightly, but don't get into that habit yet. That's something that developed in my world. That's something that developed over time. So you was asking, did you ever injure yourself? I have not yet injured myself with tamping. I have injured myself with hot water. But, you know, that, that's a whole other story. What else is there to cover with tamping? I think that's pretty much everything. We've gone over the basic ergonomics, how to do, you know, training with it. You get a scale. They're 20 bucks. They're easy to use. Oh, and like I was going back to that, the, uh, like I said, it's a completely arbitrary number, the 20, degree, the 20 pounds. You can use 10 pounds. So if you find 20 pounds to be difficult, use 10 pounds. You'll have to, but, but the, th the key is that you want to practice and practice and practice so that you're always, so you get that muscle memory of pushing the 20 pounds or the 10 pounds or the 15 pounds or whatever pound you decide. You don't need to go more than 20. Like you could go to 100 pounds if you really want, but there's no real need for that. Um, there is also the argument that you don't have to do that, right? Like arguably this type of thing, the distribution, and this doesn't really put much pressure on it, I don't think. Um, and some people have experimented with just basically distributing the coffee and then lock and loading and brewing. And, you know, there is that good theory where the water pressure at 135 PSI or so, right, that comes at eight or nine bars, that comes down to the coffee, 
you know, does compress the coffee inside the portafilter. And I've seen tests where people, you know, did that and the results were perfectly fine. So, yeah, it's kind of your, your call in this. But just uh, the, the key is to practice and get consistency, right? Because once you develop consistency, then it becomes easier to isolate any kind of issues that you're, that you're finding in your coffee making. And then it becomes easier to rectify that. Like, for example, if you're, tamp if you're making shots and they're kind of wild, but your tamping pressure, right? If you're 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 40 pounds, 10 pounds, 50 pounds, 20 pounds for every successive shot, that's one more factor that is now floating and can be contributing to the problems that you're having with your shots. But the more that you can isolate, the more that you can gain consistency over what you're doing, consistency and uniformity in your technique, then it becomes easier to isolate issues that are affecting your coffee. And that's really what we teach them, you know, as professional breezes. We teach them how to be more consistent, how to put together everything so that their techniques are consistent. And then when they have problems, really, ideally, that you want to make it so that your technique it's consistent enough so that when you do have problems, you can usually isolate them down to problems with distribution, problems with grind, and maybe problems of quantity. And that's pretty much it. Oh, Yelma wants to know, can I make a shot? Sure, why not? Let's do that. I did bring some coffee here. Another thing that I, I think that's good to do Oops, let me just pull this up a little bit. Another thing that I think is good to do is to also have, I have not adjusted the grind on this thing, so I have no idea where we are. Let me pull that back so you can see what's going on, what I'm actually doing. It's a good thing I have some coffee left over from uh, this week's roasting. <laughs> I almost don't have any coffee left. That would be just kind of strange. All right, so let's, we're going to grind. And the way that I like to make coffee is that I like to, I like to utilize um, 21 grams. I know a lot of people are into 18 grams. I like 20 grams, 21 As always, you want to make sure that your portafilter is nice and clean so your basket does not have any old coffee hiding out. You know, it may seem like a minor thing, but the old coffee that's inside your portafilter can lead to, you know, bitterness and just off flavors that are not pleasant. Oops. It's a little bit much. All right, so we're going to put some coffee in here. Another thing that we would do at Spro is that we would actually teach our baristas, we would do drills on dosing so that they could get 21 grams all the time without necessarily needing a scale. All right, so now that I've, I'm doing the distribution thing, I'm really just using my finger to push it around, right? And I'm leaving a little bit of mound, mainly because um, it's just going to... The idea is that, it, well, I've got a little bit of extra coffee and I don't want to waste it, but also I want to, I'm going to use that and the convex shape. Oh, no, this is not convex. This is actually flat. Well, the idea is that it's going to push a little bit on the outside. So as you can see here, this is my temping, right? So I've got the, the elbow, the, the, the elbow is bent. The, arm, the forearm is straight. The wrist is straight, and then I'm going to give it a little bit of a twist just to give it a little polish. Now, there's always a little bit left extra. So I'm going to clean off the wings. Yeah, okay, good. All right, now, can you see that? Can I see that? 
I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Let's see. Zoom in a little bit. Let's see if that looks better. All right. We're going to flush the group head, make sure that it runs clean. And we're going to let that sputtering get away from us. And for this particular shot, what we're going to do is I'm going to put it in this big bowl. It, for me, it's very different to use this type of machine. I really need to adjust that. I should be testing the grind first, but that works. Should be a lot better. Could be a lot better. All right, there's the crema. So light brown, a little bit of reddishness. See this? Like the, here's a little bit of a tech tip. See right here? There's a little bit of blonding there. It, the coloration is different. That is an indication that the. Hold on. Let me readjust. That little bit of blonding is an indication that the coffee is done. And what, the technique that we really use to make our coffee is that really I'm allowing the coffee to tell me, to talk to me. And that little bit of blonding says that, hey, I'm done. And maybe went a little bit far, but look at that. Actually, the crema is nice and thick. It's sloshing around a bit. Let me show you. And I'm actually kind of surprised at how nice it is it's holding up like even on the sides here right mm. there's some fruitiness there that's actually kind of nice i think it's a little bit on the brighter side it's, it was a little bit of an elongated shot like i said that blonding tells me so what i was saying that the moment that i see blonding happening coming out of the portafilter that's the coffee telling me that it's finished and that's the moment when we should be stopping. This one ran, went a little bit longer because we saw those like striations of a blonde in the crema. So a little bit long. You can you can taste that here. You can taste a little bit of brightness that's happening because of that. Also the brightness because it's a little bit of a lighter roast. Not our normal uh, full city type of uh, espresso roast. Uh, young ones, you could probably roast outside. It's pretty hot. Yeah, man, it is blazing. Like yesterday morning, we, we did some roasting yesterday morning. And I was, I wanted, cause, because what was it? Tuesday morning, it was pretty cool until about 10, 11 o'clock. Yesterday morning, we started at 7, and it was already. It wasn't as hot and humid as it is here today, but it was pretty heavy duty. All right, so that's pretty much it. If you have any questions about tampers or tamping, um, drop them in the comments. If you're watching the replay, thank you very much for watching. Drop those in the comments down below. And um, yeah, we'll work that into future live streams. I'm still not sure if we're going to be, how often we're going to be doing. It's like this is two of these coffee Q&A live streams this week. Next week, I'm going to be away uh, visiting some coffee shops in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So that should be kind of fun. So thank you very much for tuning in and hope this helps. Let me know if you have any questions about coffee or anything like that. And uh, see you next time.